everybody. All right, so this is some lab material here that I want to pull back with you, first of all. All right, so important concepts off of the slide are what gray matter is, okay? Anywhere where you cannot find myelin, okay? So that's going to be unmyelinated axons, cell bodies, dendrites, and the glial cells. Glial cells do not have myelin, okay? So if you know that, then you know white matter is just going to be myelinated axons. It gets its white coloration from all right, the myelin that is produced in the central nervous system by the oligodendrocytes. In the peripheral nervous system, the myelin sheath is produced by the Schwann cells or the neural lemocytes. Okay? So when we talk about the gray matter in the spinal cord, remember, in the brain, the gray matter is on the outside. White matter is on the inside. Okay? We flip-flop that and we get the spinal cord. The white matter will be more on the outside. And the gray matter will be more on the inside. It'll look like that little uh, gray H or a butterfly, however you want to describe it. Okay? So this is the gray matter here on the inside, all that. Okay? So when we're talking about uh, areas of the gray matter in our H-like pattern there, okay, we have three places or horns, all right, where we're going to find this gray matter, all right, or we name the gray matter, okay? The posterior horn, think of it, it's going to be pretty much sensory neurons, all right, and also the cell bodies of our interneurons, okay? So most sensory neurons are going to be the primary neuron. They come in from the periphery. And in some cases, they can synapse uh, to an interneuron, or they can enter into the spinal cord and ascend up a level or several levels, go up to the brain stem, whatever, okay? So keep in mind, the posterior horns are going to contain our sensory neurons. The anterior horns, remember, motors in the front. So anterior horns are going to house the cell bodies of the somatic motor neurons, which means all of those somatic motor neurons are going to innervate skeletal muscle, period, end of story, done. Innervated by the somatic nervous system, which means you have voluntary control over those neurons. And then we have our lateral horns. Now, they're only present, keep in mind, in T1 through L2 of the spinal cord. Okay? We'll talk about that when we get to chapter 15. All right? We give, that's going to be relevant to something. All right? But in the lateral horn, we're going to see the cell bodies of our autonomic motor neurons. Autonomic motor neurons are going to innervate cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. Okay? So it's going to look somewhat like this. Again, this is a quick review. All right, here you can see, here's the gray horn. Here's the posterior gray horn. Here's the anterior gray horn. Here's the lateral gray horn. Okay? So in the posterior gray horn, we're going to get... All right, the sensory neurons will enter in both from the somatic sensory and visceral sensory neurons, all right? And they'll either synapse onto an inner neuron or they can ascend up into the spinal cord somewhere, okay? Point being is they wind up in the back portion, the posterior horn. All right, the anterior horn is going to be the cell bodies for the somatic motor neurons. The lateral horn will be the cell bodies for the autonomic or visceral motor neurons. Okay. All right. Also, here in the gray uh, in the gray matter, all right, we've got our gray commissure, all right, and that's that part of the H that crosses over from the right and the left. Okay, that's this area right here. All right, and in the center of it, we've got a little hole. Okay, that's the central canal, loaded with uh, um, dependable cells and cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. So if you're in the gray matter, you're dealing with unmyelinated axons, all right? They're going to be traveling from, all right, from one side of the body to the other side of the body. Okay, since we're in the central nervous system, where we see a group of cell bodies, all right, we call those a nuclei. In the peripheral nervous system, all right, when we see a, a group of cell bodies or a cluster of cell bodies, we call that a ganglia. Okay, but we are in the central nervous system because the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. All right, so our nuclei, we have sensory and motor nuclei. 
okay? Again, our sensory nuclei are going to be made up of somatic sensory, which is our, what we can consciously perceive, all right? Our five senses, pain, temperature, all right, proprioception, touch, all that, all right? That's going to be the somatic sensory nuclei. All right, visceral sens sensory nuclei are going to get information from our internal organs and our blood vessels, okay? How much stretch is going on in the stomach wall, okay? What type of chemicals are deficient or in great abundance in our bloodstream? All, right? All of that information is going to arrive into our spinal cord through the visceral sensory nuclei, okay? Going to the front area, the motor nuclei, okay? Motor nuclei are going to be found in the anterior and lateral horns, right? That's going to be purely motor neurons, right? In the way, 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 way front, in the anterior horn, that's going to be our somatic motor nuclei. One tissue, skeletal muscle, okay? Voluntary control. Autonomic motor nuclei, that's going to be in the lateral horn, okay? It's going to be our remaining effector organs, which is smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. All right. Do you feel pretty good about that? Somewhat, okay? Let's keep it simple. All right, so this picture here, and again, I know I talked about this last week, but I just kind of want to drive it home, okay? Because we're going to actually do the, the motor tracks here in a moment in the spinal cord. So that's what we're looking at here. All right, I just went over this just a few moments ago. Here are all the, 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 um, the central nervous system or the spinal cord uh, nuclei here, okay? In the back is our sensory. In the front is going to be our motor, okay? All right, quick review on the distribution of white matter, and then we'll go back into our lecture material here, okay? Now, the white matter, simple to remember, myelinated axons, that's it, okay? And these are going to be either coming from the brain or going to the brain, okay? So if we're in the back, all right, back here, <laughs> actually, hold on. I'll subject you some more of my bad drawings here, okay? So if we're in the back, that is going to be what we call the posterior funiculus. That is here, all right, that little spot of white matter, okay? Sensory tracts, okay? Proprioception, uh, uh, vibration, touch, discriminative touch, things of that nature, all right? That is the posterior funiculus. The lateral funiculus is here on either side of our H, all right? That is going to be mixed, okay, with motor and sensory tracts. So they're going to be ascending if they're sensory, descending if they're motor, all right? And then finally, in the front, all right, the anterior, okay, the anterior is going to be mi mixed also, okay? So it'll have both ascending and descending tracks there. Okay, so we're going to break it down, but you'll see little groups, all right, in, the, in this funiculus, little uh, uh, clusters. And those clusters, all right, we call fasciculi. Okay, fasciculi. <clears throat> so when we jump up here to this little slide here, okay, in our posterior funiculus, Okay, we have some bundling of our axons, right, on one side and some on the other, okay, it's the same on either side, all right, the more medial, right, fasciculi are going to be what we call the, fascicul the fascicularis gracilis, and then more lateral will be the fascicularis cuneatus, all right, these are all sensory tracts. Then we have our mixed tracts here, and we talked about some of them, the spinal cerebellar, pathway. We haven't talked about um, the uh, spinal thalamic yet. All right, we'll talk about those in a moment. Okay, so you'll have some uh, sensory and some motor, and then also in the front, you're going to have some sensory and some motor. All right, we're going to talk about some of these today. Okay, I just wanted to review that with you folks. Okay, because today we're going to start to get into spinal nerve branches. What happens now when we have these spinal nerves and what goes on with that? All right, but we're, we're going to come back to that. All right, so let's pull back Get back into our lecture mode here because I want to wrap up the motor tracks, the ascend, or excuse me, the descending tracks, and then I want to get into um, I want to get into reflexes.
Flexors are always fun. Okay, so let's talk about our motor pathways here, okay? Another name for motor pathways are going to be descending tracks or pathways, okay? So our motor pathways are going to control, all right, the skeletal muscles. All right, so we saw before in the ascending pathways, the sensory pathways, all right, how you can have two or more neurons, okay? In our motor pathways, we're going to have at least two neurons are going to be involved, okay? So we break it down into what we call upper and, mo upper and lower motor neurons, okay? So basically, the upper motor neuron is going to originate either in the motor cortex, you guys remember where that is, right? And the precentral gyrus up in the frontal lobe there, okay? Or one of our cerebral nuclei or a brainstem nucleus. If it's a brainstem nucleus, we're usually talking about a cranial nerve, okay? And this upper motor neuron is going to descend all the way down all right, usually into the spinal cord, and it'll synapse or connect with a lower motor neuron, okay? That lower motor neuron, all right, is going to be found either in our cranial nerve nucleus, okay, or the spinal cord. And it's going to be found in the anterior horn. Why? We're dealing with skeletal muscles, y'all. So we're going to be dealing with the somatic nervous system, right? And it's going to travel out, all right, and it'll stimulate the contraction, the excitation of a muscle, okay? So we're going to talk about that pathway. So the first pathway we're going to discuss is the direct, all right, or the pyramidal pathway, all right? So this is the one that many of you are using right now as you're writing, typing, taking notes, all right? This is what you're going to be utilizing. So these motor pathways are going to follow, all right, these uh, characteristics, upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron, okay? So we'll start off here with the motor, uh, the, the direct pathway here first, all right, our pyramidal pathways, okay? So basically, we're going to talk about what happens all the way from the brain all the way down to the skeletal muscles. So we're going to start off with our upper motor neuron, all right? Where is it going to start? The primary motor cortex, all right, in the frontal lobe, all right? It's going to descend down, okay, from the cerebral cortex through the internal capsule, which is the white matter inside the cerebrum. It's going to travel through the cerebral peduncles there, all right, that we saw in the brain stem. And it's going to travel down through the spinal cord, through the cortical spinal tracts. I'm going to come right back and show you. Here you go. Here's our primary motor cortex. Okay, so our upper motor neuron travels down here through this white matter, which is the internal capsule, descends all the way down into, all right, our brainstem, through the midbrain here and those front areas here, which is the cerebral peduncles, okay? Travels down, all right? We'll talk about what's going to happen here in a moment when we get to the medulla oblongata because some of those fibers will cross and some will not, all right? Those that cross, okay, will wind up in what we call the lateral cortical spinal tract. Now, if you look at the name, cortical cerebral cortex spinal, it's telling us where it originated and where it's going. It's going from the cerebral cortex down through the spine out into the body, okay? So it's going to be in the lateral portion here, the lateral funiculus. So the lateral cortical spinal tracts will decusate, which means they cross over, right, from the, in this case from the left side of the body to the right side of the spinal cord. Okay? And then they'll synapse onto the lower motor neuron. Okay? Come right back. Oh, not that. Not there. There. Okay? So we see those axons go down through the internal capsule and through the cerebral peduncles there in the midbrain into the cortical spinal tracts. All right? Now they'll enter into the spinal cord, okay, and they'll synapse on the lower motor neuron. Okay, that lower motor neuron is going to be located, the cell body will be located in the anterior horn. We just talked about that. Remember, the anterior horn, all right, is where we find, all right, the cell bodies, all right, for our somatic motor neurons, specifically the cell bodies 
of the somatic lower motor neuron. And then that will go out to the skeletal muscle here. Okay? So that's the general uh, pathway. Now, now we're going to break it down because there's two. All right? We got the lateral cortical spinal tract. That's the one that crosses over in the brain stem. And then we got the anterior cortical spinal tract. That's the one that's going to cross over in the spinal cord. All right? Because remember, over 80% all right, of these tracts will cross over somewhere. All right, going along with what we were saying, it, all right, your left side of your brain controls the right side of your body and vice versa, okay? So now let's get specific here, all right? So the lateral cortical spinal tract, okay, is going to cross over. It's the same thing. It's going to start here, all right? It's going to start up here in the primary motor cortex. It descends down, enters into the cerebral peduncle, gets down to the medulla oblongata, and then we've got that decusation in the pyramids there, right, in which the anterior, all right, uh, I'm sorry, the lateral, excuse me, the lateral cortical spinal tract will cross over, all right, at the decusation. So let me go back, all right. So it crosses over, all right, at the medulla's pyramids there, and then it descends down in the lateral funiculus, all right, where it'll actually then synapse onto the lower motor neuron that's found in the anterior horn. Then that lower motor neuron will exit out on that side, all right, and it will innervate, important that you know this, limb muscles, okay, upper and lower limbs. Okay, so the lateral cortical spinal tract will innervate your upper and lower limbs. Skill movement, yes. Okay, so the other pyramidal pathway is the anterior cortical spinal tract, all right? This one does not cross over in the medulla, all right? It is going to descend down, all right? And it's actually going to enter into the spinal cord and it'll travel in the anterior funiculi. Well, the anterior funiculi, you remember what that is, okay? That's in the front, right here. That's the anterior funiculi, that white matter there, okay? So what it will do is it will cross over at a specific level in the spinal cord. It varies, depending if it's an upper part of the body or a lower part of the body, okay? So if it's going to go to an upper part of your body, like say your chest, all right, then it's probably going to cross over either in the cervical spine or in the, in the thoracic spine, all right? If it's going to be cross, if it's going to be innervating, all right, some of the um, skeletal muscle down in the lower part of your torso and your pelvis or whatnot, then it's going to cross over most likely in the lower portion of the thoracic or the lumbar area, okay? Point being is it's going to cross over. That's what decusate means, crossing over at a level in the spinal cord, okay? And it has two options at that point. All right, when it crosses over, it can directly synapse or contact the lower motor neuron, or it can synapse on an interneuron, and then that interneuron can then synapse onto the lower motor neuron. Okay? Regardless, that lower motor neuron is now going to innervate axial skeletal muscle. So that's going to be the anterior. Easy to remember. Anterior begins with an A, axial begins with, a, with an A. Okay? Questions so far? Okay. All right, so let's take a look here at the picture. Here you can see, okay? So we'll follow, all right, the lateral one, which is the internal one here, the more medial. So the lateral cortical spinal tract here descends from the cerebral cortex, down in through the cerebral peduncles in the midbrain, decusates or crosses over at the pyramids in the medulla oblongata. All right, we'll travel here in the lateral funiculus, okay? In the lateral, you want to be specific, it's going to be in the lateral cortical spinal pathway here, and it'll synapse right onto the lower motor neuron, okay, in the axis, excuse me, in the anterior horn. And then that lower motor neuron, psh, We'll go out to the skeletal muscle, all right? The anterior, okay, will not decusate here in the medulla oblongata. It'll stay ipsilateral, 
descends down to a specific level in the spinal cord, then it crosses over, all right, in the anterior funiculus here, and then it can either directly synapse onto the lower motor neuron or it can synapse onto an interneuron, which then that interneuron can all, then synapse onto the lower motor neuron, all right? But the point being is it crosses over at the spinal cord level, okay? So those are the direct pathways, all right? So let's talk about the indirect pathways, all right? When we're talking about the indirect pathways, and there's going to be a couple of them, all right? When we're talking about the indirect pathways, the upper motor neuron, okay, is now going to originate in the brainstem. All right, so the indirect are a little bit more complicated, all right? So they're going to kind of, we're not going to get into the details of that. One, because this isn't a neuroanatomy class, and there's a lot involved, all right? I just want you to know what pathway does what, okay? What I mean by that is, for example, the lateral pathway is going to regulate precise, refined movements, all right, in the flexor limb muscles, okay? So one of the pathways is the, the rubral spinal tract. That starts off in the midbrain, okay? The red nucleus is part of that. We briefly mentioned that, okay, when we were going over um, parts of the, of the brain stem there. Okay, that's the lateral pathway. The medial pathway, all right, similar. It's going to help to regulate muscle tone and movements of head, neck, proximal limb, and trunk. And so there are three tracks for that, which we're going to talk about here. All right. So again, very complicated pathway for all right, these tracks from the brain stem all right, to uh, the spinal cord and then out to whatever the effector um, uh, organs are going to be. But I still want you to understand all right, that these all start here in the brain stem, okay? and then pretty much what their job is. All right, so let's talk about those last three tracks here. All right, do you need me to go back? I saw you look up. <laughs> no, no worries. It'll give me a chance to give you a sip of water. Here. All right. Now we've talked about some of the components to some of these pathways. All right, like like the reticulospinal pathway. All right, reticulospinal pathway. Um, the remember the reticular formation. How that's involved. The reticular formation kind of governs muscle tone. All right. And so with the reticular spinal pathway, all right, it is going to determine and help with what you all are using right now, posture and, well, not so much balance, all right, but, but more so, all right, posture sitting there, somewhat balanced, so you're not falling out of your chairs there, okay? So there's going to be certain reflexes that are going to help with that, okay? So when you're self-correcting, okay, you lean over to grab something out of your backpack while you're sitting, all right, and you start to kind of... Uh, I won't say fall out of your chair, but you kind of move out of the chair unexpectedly, all right, it's the reticulospinal pathway that helps to regulate that so you don't fall out, okay? Tectospinal, this is where we're going to be talking about, remember those big bumps that we saw on the tectal plate on the back of the midbrain there, all right, the superior colliculi of the corpora quadremina and the inferior collicula, colliculi of the corpora quadremula, quadremula, it's a mouthful, right? But they're both going to help with reflexes involving both visual and auditory stimuli, okay? Like I was saying with the superior, okay, when you're watching a tennis match and they're volleying back and forth and both your eyes are tracking the ball, all right, that is going to utilize the superior colliculus, okay? For the auditory, that's the one when someone is calling your name behind you, and if they're sitting to the right of you, you look over your right shoulder, all right? You, it helps you to localize the sound. All right, so those tectal spinal tracts will help with that. And then finally, vestibular spinal, if you look at the beginning part of it, vestibular, think of the vestibular apparatus balance, okay? So the vestibular nuclei, all right, are going to help with maintaining balance. You're using it all right now, all right, as you're sitting there, all right? When I get up and kind of pace around while I'm teaching, 
I, I use my vestibulospinal tracts to help with that. Okay, so they will incorporate not only your primary motor uh, um, cortex, but it also utilizes right, your cerebellum, all right, and different aspects. A lot of these um, pathways here will kind of pull different parts of your brain stem and some of your senses kind of together. And we'll talk about parts of them when we get to chapter 16, all right. We're not going to get too detailed on it. All right, but we'll see, especially when we get into balance and equilibrium, we'll, we'll kind of revisit the vestibular spinal tracts, okay? All right, so Superman, one of the uh, first renditions of the modern-day Superman uh, was played by, a care, uh, by an actor named Christopher Reeves back in the 80s. I think it might have been the first movie. It was in the late 70s. Anyways, um, he unfortunately had an unfortunate accident while playing polo, fell off a horse, and he broke his neck, and he damaged, I think it was, it was upper cervical, and I can't remember if it was C2 or C3, but he ended up causing a spinal cord injury, and he was paralyzed, couldn't move his arm, he was a quadriplegic, and he also uh, had difficulty with breathing, obviously bowel and bladder uh, habits and whatnot, so when folks, and again, it depends on where the injury occurs, but when folks experience all right, spinal cord injuries, all right, it can result, depending on the severity of the injury, you know, in paralysis. All right, they can either be a, 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 quadri a quadriplegic, when all four uh, limbs are paralyzed, or a paraplegic, when just usually the lower extremities are going to be paralyzed. But along with that, all right, They've lost motor movement, all right, but also sensations, all right, numbness. They can't feel anything. Anyways, point being is when this occurs, all right, treatment needs to be rendered, and it needs to be rendered immediately. The sooner that you're able to treat these individuals, all right, the less likely, all right, permanent or severe, depending on the, the severity of the injury, all right, uh, deficits will occur. Perfect example. Can't, I, I, every semester when I tell this story, I, I keep saying, I'm going to look the guy's name up, and I don't. He was a football player for the Buffalo Bills. This was back almost like a decade, well over a decade ago. In a game, got hit, and he ended up getting paralyzed, couldn't move on the field. So they were using a new type of treatment in the, in the hospitals up in Buffalo, New York, in which they, when they got into the hospital, no, actually before he even got off the field, they infused his spinal cord with – Ice cold saline, saline solution, all right? Ice cold saline helped to reduce inflammation. They gave him steroids to help reduce the inflammation. They gave him antibiotics to help reduce, all right, the chances of infections, all right? But between the steroids and that ice cold saline solution, all right, they managed to minimize the damage to his spinal cord, keep the swelling and inflammation to a minimum, and he's not playing football anymore, obviously, but he's he's able to walk around. He can throw a football, not that he was a quarterback, all right, but he's able to live a somewhat normal life had he not undergone that uh, type of injury there. Okay, so we're seeing, all right, the use of some neural stem cells, okay, because unfortunately central nervous system uh, uh, axons or neurons cannot regenerate, okay? If they're damaged, all right, depending on the severity of the damage, all right, Scar tissue formation occurs, loss of function for those neurons. But we are seeing in a limited capacity that we are able to regenerate all right, those axons. That's huge. Peripheral nervous system, they can regenerate all right, to a certain degree. Also, it depends on the amount of damage there. All right, so we're going to cover this more in lab today, so I'm just going to kind of gloss over this. Today in lab, we're going to talk about, all right, remember what we said, all right, we talk about a nerve that comes off the spinal cord is a spinal nerve and how a spinal nerve is a mixed nerve. It has sensory neurons and motor neurons. Sensory neurons carry information up to the spinal cord and brain. Motor neurons carry output information from the brain and spinal cord out to the periphery. So it's like a bi-directional structure. We're going to talk about all right, what happens to the spinal nerve once it exits out of your spinal canal. Okay, so we're going to talk about all this stuff here. 
all right, how we have a posterior ramus, an anterior ramus, all right, so I'm going to save that for lab. But it brings me into what we call dermatomes, okay? And dermatomes are going to be areas of your skin that are actually going to receive sensory input from one single spinal nerve. So if you're complaining of numbness in your fingertips or numbness along your belly button, all right, or your xiphoid process there by your sternum, all right, I can determine, okay, all right, because of where these sensations are, it doesn't have to necessarily be numbness. It could be decreased uh, sensation or actually increased sensation, all right? But I can tell, all right, depending on where you're describing this numbness, tingling sensation, what spinal nerve root is involved. Okay, so for example, we're talking about the belly button, the umbilicus, okay, if you're saying I've got this, stri this strip of skin around my belly button that it, I don't feel a thing, then I say, oh, that's T10, okay, there's something going on with the spinal nerve of T10. If it's along the nipple line, that's going to be T7, okay, all right, so we're going to see, all right, or T4, excuse me, okay. And same thing in your hands, all right? If you're getting numbness and tingling in your middle finger, I say that's C8, all right, pinky, T1. All right, point being is, all right, we can tell when you have certain symptoms if there has been damage, all right, to one particular spinal nerve or more, all right? Now, we've heard of this term before, referred pain, all right? The actual term is referred visceral pain. That's the pain that you feel when you're having a heart attack or when you're having appendicitis, okay? And we'll get into the, the, to the phenomena with the appendicitis there, why that causes, all right, uh, how that all works, all right, later on. All right, so here's the map, our dermatome map, so you can see, all right, all of these areas here, all right, of where specific dermatomes are listed, all right? Down in the leg is gonna be the lumbar. Thoracic is gonna be the, uh, middle portion of your chest, your abdominal region, all right, cervical will be your arms, okay, shoulders, neck. <clears throat> now notice for the face, all right, it isn't a spinal nerve, it's the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve innervates your face. There's three parts of the trigeminal nerve, okay, they have three different divisions, okay, but for everything else, it's going to be the spinal nerves, all right, back of the neck, front of the neck, side of the neck, top of the shoulders, all the way up to the top of your head, your scalp there. All right, which brings me to this, shingles. Got to love shingles. If anybody knows anybody that's ever had a shingles uh, infection, it sucks. It's painful. You've had it twice, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, and it varies depending on the severity of it because I had a colleague of mine and she had shingles and she had to take uh, steroids for six months and some antivirals. And hers are bad. Hers are bad. Some people can get it on the eye. I mean, it's, it's awful. Basically, it's just the uh, varicella zoster, which is the same virus that causes chicken pox. And what happens is it's still in all of us. It sits dormant in the posterior or dorsal root ganglion. In case you don't remember what that is, that's this guy. There it is. That's where chicken pox is hanging out. It's just waiting. It's waiting for you to let your guard down. It's waiting for you <clears throat> to not take care of yourself. Compromise your immune system. It overwhelms you, and it comes out. And what will happen is it'll travel out of the dorsal root ganglion, and it'll travel down the sensory axons of that particular dermatome. So you can tell exactly which dorsal root ganglion it came to. If it's a localized infection, depending on where it is, all right. Most of the, most of the time, it's on the back, so it's usually in one of the thoracic, all right. But we'll see blistering, rash, lots of pain, lots of pain. Okay. So yes, we have vaccines to help deal with it, all right. I've never taken the vaccine. I know they really push it in the older population. But those are going to be people that are usually are more at risk for being immune deficient, all right? As long as you're taking good care of yourself, you should, you should be okay. You know, get enough sleep, keep the stress low in your life. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know of anybody that's like, I'm living a stress-free life right now. Nobody. Okay. I want to jump into one of my favorite, favorite topics of this course, and that's about reflexes.
Okay. And in fact, I'm actually uh, in another section of mine, I've been talking about reflexes quite a bit because we're discussing the digestive system. The digestive system is basically all about reflexes. That's really what it is. Okay. So we need to really focus and grasp the concept of what a reflex is. All right. To understand this material that we're going to go over. So I'm going to kind of take my time with it. All right. Because we got time. Okay, so the definition of a reflex is a rapid, pre-programmed, involuntary response of muscles or glands to a stimulus. So the big thing here is we need a stimulus. All right, actually, I should be circling this. We need a stimulus to initiate a reflex. Okay, without a stimulus, you're not going to have a reflex. Okay, and it varies. A pain stimulus. Okay, like if you touch a hot pan, all right, that pain, all right, is going to be, the hot pan is the stimulus, all right, that burning sensation is going to be with the receptor, all right, your pain receptor, all right, is going to pick up, all right, but that is going to initiate a reflex here, okay? So, notice the first word here in the definition of reflexes is rapid, okay? A, a, a reflex is going to be quick because... It involves, all right, a couple, and I say a couple, it can be more than a couple, but it's going to involve at least two neurons. And if it's going to be two, because that's the, the minimal amount, it's going to be a sensory and a motor neuron. Sometimes it might involve, it's always going to involve at least one sensory and one motor neuron. Sometimes it might involve um, an inner neuron, so you might have three, okay? The more neurons that are involved, the slower the reflex will be. I mean, they're still fast, all right? They're still fast. Okay, so one of the beautiful things about reflexes, because they, yes, they are part of our survival mechanisms, all right, is that they're pre-programmed. So it's going to happen the same every time. You touch something hot, you're going to pull your hand away. You step on attack, you're going to pull your foot away. Okay, the doctor takes that hammer and hits you on the knee with it, you're going to get a, a, a knee-jerk reflex. Okay, so they're pre-programmed all the same. And what I love about them is they're involuntary. Okay, you can't control it, you know. You can't control, like, how you're going to respond, all right. And by the time you realize what happened, that sensation has already passed, all right. That stimulus could, could have already – all that uh, machinery has already occurred, okay. When you go and to the doctor and they tap the, the hammer on your knee, all right, by the time you realize what's going on, yeah, you feel the hammer hitting your knee, all right, but by the time you're actually feeling it, your knee is usually uh, jumped, all right, or your leg is actually jumped. Similar type of scenario when we're dealing with different visceral systems in your body, all right, like for digestion, for example, because that's the hot topic that I'm on now, all right, just sometimes you ever notice when you start to think about some, like food, like you're really hungry and you're like, mm, I could really go for apple pie or steak if you're into steaks or whatever, or someone's telling you about a really good meal that they had, and you're listening to them, and they're describing, and you're like, man, my mouth is watering, all right? And then your stomach starts to growl. Those are reflexive responses, all right? The actual stimulus was your thought of the, of the food, stimulating the limbic system. Or if you actually see a commercial, and you're like, man, that food looks good on TV. That's a visual stimulus that you're picking up, okay? So again, keep in mind that these a lot of these reflexes are going to help all right, us for survival, all right, because without it, you know, we could be dead. All right, so when we talk about this reflex arc, all right, we're talking about this whole pathway system, all right, to generate a response. So it's going to start with a stimulus, the nail on the skin in this example. There's our stimulus, which will trigger pain receptors to send Sensory input up the sensory neuron to our control center. See, I said control center. We all know what that is from, from uh, chapter one. Okay? So we're going to use a sensory neuron. All right? That sensory information will enter into the, the central nervous system, our control center here. All right? And in this case, it's going to be processed by the interneuron. All right, now the inner neuron does a couple of things. One of the things it'll do is it's going to stimulate the motor neuron, all right, and that motor neuron is going to stimulate the effector organ. In this case, our effector organ is 
Oh, skeletal muscle. So it's going to move that skeletal muscle, maybe away from that nail. That nail is sticking out of the wall. Okay. At the same time, all right, one of the collaterals that comes off the inner neuron is going to ascend up to the cerebral cortex. And that's when you get conscious perception of the reflex, whatever the stimulus was and what your response was. Okay. All right, so we're going to classify a couple of our spinal reflexes. All right, so there's quite a few. So I'm going to walk you through them. All right, spinal or cranial. Well, what does that mean? All right, does it involve just the spinal cord or does it involve just the brain? Okay, whatever the control center is going to be. It's either the spinal cord or the brain. All right, now some of the reflexes that I'm going to go over with you here today are going to be spinal cord reflexes. We're not even going to utilize the brain, okay, which is cool. When you get into later chapters, not in this semester, but in 211, you'll talk about some of the uh, uh, cranial reflexes, like I was just saying, all right, salivation, all right, when we talk about digestion, some of the cardiovascular uh, reflexes in the cardiac center, respiratory center, all right, that will involve the brain, okay. Somatic or visceral, what is the effector? If it's somatic, it's skeletal muscle. If it's visceral, is it going to be cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or gland? Okay. But monosynaptic and polysynaptic, all right, how many neurons and how many synapses are going to be involved? If it's just two neurons, it's going to be monosynaptic, mono being one. And that synapse is going to occur between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron. Poly meaning many, okay? So we have polysynaptic where it's going to involve more than two neurons, which means we have an inner neuron involved, right? And polysynaptic will be a little bit slower, okay? Because remember, what's the slowest part, all right, of a nerve signal? When it has to go from an action potential electro, an electrical signal into a chemical sig signal at the synaptic cleft and then back to an electrical signal, okay? So that's where we slow things down is at the synapse. All right, is it on the same side of the body? It's ipsilateral. Is it on the other side of the body? It's contralateral, okay? So it depends on wherever the stimulus occurs and where that receptor is, right, do those signals go to the other side? And then finally, is it innate? Are you born with it? Or is it something you develop after birth, which is acquired, okay? You guys good so far? Okay, cool, 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 cool. Okay. So let me show you. Wee! Monosynaptic and polysynaptic. Real easy here, okay? Here's our, our, our stimulus, the hammer hitting the knee, all right? You get a stretch reflex going on. The sensory uh, receptor picks up on that, sends its sensory information into the sensory neuron, which directly synapses onto the motor neuron. And the motor neuron transmits its effector response back to the effector organ, which is the skeletal muscle, and you get the kick. Okay? It's monosynaptic. Okay? Direct communication between sensory and motor neurons. Polysynaptic, all right? You have more than one synapse. Okay? So we're going to involve an interneuron. That's simple. That's simple. Okay? All right, so I'm going to talk to you about the four common spinal reflexes. All right, so when I'm talking about, when I say spinal, that means we're not going to involve the brain. We're just going to involve the spinal cord here, okay? So the four common spinal reflexes are the stretch reflex, okay? The Golgi tendon reflex, the withdrawal reflex, and the cross extensor reflex, okay? The first two, the stretch reflex and the Golgi tendon reflex, reflex involve, okay, they both involve proprioceptors. Okay, so finally, you've heard me talk about proprioceptors. Now you get to see what the deal is with proprioceptors, okay? So the specific proprioceptor that we're going to discuss, we give it a special name, is the muscle spindle. And its job is to detect how much stretch is in a muscle. Well, that's good, right? You don't want to overstretch a muscle, okay? Anyone here like Marvel movies? I like Marvel movies. Uh, Captain America, the Winter Soldier. That was the second Captain America movie. There's a scene 
in which Captain America is on this building. He's holding on to part of the building, and he's holding on to a helicopter that's trying to pull away from the building. And that helicopter is moving away. Now, thank goodness he's got super strong muscles and tissues and whatnot. But I'll be darned if he wasn't invoking his stretch reflex during that scene, all right, when he was trying to prevent that helicopter from moving away. So that's what we're going to talk about here, all right? We're going to talk about the stretch reflex here, okay? And we need to first define for you folks what a muscle spindle is, okay? So muscle spindle is made up of a couple of things. You have an intrafusal muscle fiber, okay, which is just a bundle of muscle fibers that are specifically innervated, all right, by the sensory neurons. And so they're going to deter – so when, when you are – affecting those muscle fibers, those intrafusal muscle fibers, okay? Those sensory neurons are going to be stimulated, okay? But the actual muscle fiber for contraction, all right, the motor component is going to be innervated by the gamma motor neurons. Now, gamma motor neurons are smaller. You should know this. They're a smaller type of motor neuron. Remember, the larger the motor neuron, all right, the faster it can conduct action potentials. Okay, so the larger the diameter, and if it's myelinated, it's going to be very fast. All right, gamma are, are, are decent size, but the largest are what we call the alpha motor neurons. And it's the alpha motor neurons that are going to innervate the extrafusal muscle fibers. So this is going to – think of the intrafusal muscle fibers. You ever seen those little uh, Russian uh, st figurines where you open it up, and there's another one inside? You open that one up, there's another one inside, okay? That's what this is like. The extrafusal muscle fiber, you open that one up, and you're going to see a little smaller muscle fiber in there. That's the intrafusal muscle fiber. So the extrafusal muscle fiber, all right, is going to be innervated by the alpha motor neurons. Those are the big ones, okay? So what's going to happen is when these muscle fibers get stretched, all right, these intrafusal muscle fibers – all right, are going to stimulate these sensory neurons to send that stretch information to the spinal cord. And we're going to talk about that. Okay. So really what you want, and I'll show you a picture. The picture's the best. All right, I'm going to come back. Okay. So here's our muscle spindle. So on the outside, this big part here, all right, those, that's the extrafusal muscle fibers. So what we've done, and now we just peel them back, and we see inside – all right, we've got a smaller grouping of muscle fibers, okay? So that smaller grouping of muscle fibers, all right, is going to have this blue sensory neuron wrapping around it. And so when they get stretched, it stimulates that sensory neuron, okay? So the intrafusal muscle fibers have this kind of pinkish motor neuron here. That's the gamma motor neuron. All right, and then you can see on the outside here, these bigger group of muscle fibers, that's the extrafusal muscle fiber. That's got a darker kind of reddish all right, motor neuron, and that's going to be the alpha motor neuron, okay? So we start to stretch this muscle, all right? It stimulates, all right, the sensory neuron here. It sends its sensory input towards the central nervous system here, all right? And we're going to see how it's going to, all right, you can see how the sensory neuron here, this one here, will directly synapse onto the gamma motor neuron to the, that direct muscle spindle there, all right, which will then go, I'm, hold on, hold on. First of all, I'm jumping ahead. Did everybody get this information here? <laughs> I, get, I get excited when I get to do these the, the reflexes because I love them. Okay. Okay, so starting off in the beginning here, when the muscle gets stretched, okay, muscle spindle will fire off the sensory neurons there. And that sensory neuron information, that input will travel, all right, to the spinal cord. Okay? So as it travels to the spinal cord, all right, that sensory neuron 
all right, is going to directly synapse onto the alpha motor neuron of the same muscle. Because think about it. If that muscle is getting stretched, say um, we'll do the biceps brachii, okay? So like in an arm wrestling contest, all right, someone is pulling my arm back, they're stretching my biceps brachii, all right? That stretch reflex is going to be initiated. Okay, so what do we do if the muscle's getting stretched? What, what, what do you want to do? If the muscle fibers are getting lengthened, how do we want to avoid injury? We want the same muscle fibers to contract, all right, so they won't get torn. Okay, so that sensory neuron is going to directly synapse and excite the alpha motor neurons of the same muscle, all right, which is going to cause that muscle to contract. That's our monosynaptic. Uh, reflex arc here, okay? My example was the biceps brachii, but fine, we'll make the example the triceps brachii, all right? So it's going to cause the triceps brachii to start to contract, all right? So they don't get overstretched. Meanwhile, meanwhile, this is important, if the triceps brachii are starting to contract so they don't get overstretched, okay? We need to inhibit the antagonistic muscle group, all right, of the muscle group that we are trying to contract. So example, all right, the triceps extend the elbow, the biceps flex the elbow, right? Okay, triceps are on the back of the arm, they straighten the arm, biceps are on the front of the arm, they flex the arm, all right, or elbow. So if... All right, my triceps are getting stretched, so uh, my arm is being forced to flex. All right, and it's stretching out those triceps. The stretch reflex gets invoked. It starts to cause the contraction of the triceps brachii. All right, wouldn't it make sense to inhibit the biceps? Because if both muscles are flexing, we're not going to get any movements going on. All right, we're going to be fighting ourselves. So what will happen is... All right, that same sensory axon all right, is going to excite the inner neurons. All right, this is going to involve a polysynaptic uh, reflex here. It's going to excite the inner neurons of the antagonistic muscle, which in our example are the biceps. All right, so it's going to make sure that the antagonistic muscle group is not contracting. Okay, so while that occurs, then our agonist muscle group can contract and prevent the overstretching. So this whole concept is called reciprocal inhibition. We're going to inhibit the antagonist muscle group so the agonist muscle group can contract to stop them from being overstretched. This type of reflex is spinal, does not go to the brain, Somatic, because we're involving skeletal muscle. Monosynaptic, all right, because we're dealing with the sensory axon directly innervating or synapsing on our alpha motor neurons. It's on the same side, okay? Doesn't cross over the spinal cord at all. And this is something that you're born with, okay? The spinal reflex of the stretch reflex. So that's what we're seeing here, okay? So the triceps muscle is getting overstretched, okay? That stimulates the sensory neuron here to send its input here into the spinal cord. All right, that same sensory neuron is going to directly synapse onto the alpha motor neuron, and it's going to stimulate the alpha motor neuron, all right, to contract so it stops it from stretching. All right, and at the same time, that sensory neuron is going to stimulate the inner neuron to inhibit the antagonistic muscle group, in this case, which is our biceps brachii, and it's going to prevent the biceps brachii from doing anything. So it won't contract. So it won't inhibit the contraction of the triceps brachii. All right, that's the stretch reflex. Our next reflex, again, dealing with proprioceptors, is going to be the Golgi tendon reflex. So our first reflex prevents the muscle from stretching too much. Well, guess what? We got a reflex that's going to prevent the muscle from contracting too much. Okay? 
So the Golgi tendon reflex is going to involve, all right, this structure here called the Golgi tendon organ, which are our proprioceptors in this case. And they're located, all right, at the area where the muscle, all right, starts to transition into the tendon. So it's at the musc musculotendinous junction there, all right? So in this situation, we are going to see that sensory axon, all right, that's going to be monitoring the amount of contraction going on, all right? It is actually, in this case, going to stimulate inner neurons in the spinal cord. So again, we have another spinal reflex here, all right? So in this situation, okay, these inner neurons are going to also inhibit some motor neurons, but in this time, we are going to inhibit that muscle, that same muscle, not the antagonistic muscle group, all right? So if my biceps brachii muscle is contracting too much, well, actually, I'm going to use the same example that the picture has here. If your quadriceps muscles are contracting too much, your thigh muscles, okay? If they're contracting too much, what the Golgi tendon reflex will do is it will inhibit the quadriceps muscles from contracting more, and it's going to then stimulate, all right, the antagonist muscle group of the quadriceps, which is what? What's on the back of your thigh? What muscle group? Oh, you're getting specific. I was going to say hamstrings. Yeah, the biceps femoris. Yeah, yeah, semitendinosus, semimembranosus. Yeah, good. Yeah, so the hamstrings muscles. Okay, good. So yeah, we're going to then excite, all right, the motor neurons that go to the antagonistic muscles so we can get those muscles to start to contract to kind of put a little bit of a stretch into our quadriceps here, okay? And so we call that concept reciprocal activation, okay? These are both polysynaptic reflexes here. So they involve inner neurons. I'm going to come right back to this slide here. Let me just show you. I like pictures. Telling this story is a little bit easier with the pictures. All right. So here we see our Golgi tendon organ where it's located as the muscle transitions here all right, into the tendon. So it's monitoring the amount of contractile force that's occurring in the muscle. So it determines that it's too much. That sensory information goes into the spinal cord. All right. Those sensory neurons then are going to synapse all right, onto inner neurons. Okay, so we'll start with the first part. All right, that inner neuron is going to inhibit the alpha motor neuron, all right, that goes to the quadriceps femoris muscle group because it's contracting too much. So we have to shut it off, all right? It's like if a car engine is running too hot. What do you do? You turn it off, all right? The muscle's contracting too much. We turn the muscle off, all right? So we shut the muscle off. Good. So it's not going to shorten anymore, all right? Now, all right, the sensory neuron is going to then activate the inner neuron, another inner neuron. Okay, that inner neuron is going to then stimulate and activate the alpha motor neuron that goes to the antagonistic muscle group. In this case, the hamstrings. That's going to cause the hamstrings to contract, which will then start to lengthen the quadriceps femoris. All right, that concept is called reciprocal activation there. Okay. We see that antagonistic muscle contraction, all right, because they're activated and not inhibited. That's our reciprocal activation. In our previous reflex, we saw reciprocal inhibition, all right? And reciprocal inhibition is when we inhibited the antagonistic muscle group, all right, while we stimulated the agonist muscle group. <clears throat> well, in the Golgi tendon reflex, we're going to excite or stimulate the antagonistic muscle group. That's our reciprocal activation. While we inhibit, all right, the agonist muscle group. And again, this all occurs on the same side, all right, so this is another ipsilateral reflex. Okay, so those were our first two reflexes, 
All right, we were talking about common spinal reflexes. All right, and they both involve proprioceptors. So you can kind of see the, the value of proprioceptors. All right, we just saw these two different types of proprioceptors basically monitoring movement that is going on at these joints here. Okay, and then uh, providing inputs into the uh, central nervous system as to what's happening. All right, our next reflex is going to be the withdrawal reflex. I like the withdrawal reflex, all right? Except when it's me stepping on a Lego in the middle of the night because then that sucks, but we'll get there. Okay, so um, the withdrawal reflex, I'm gonna use that same example, all right? Stepping on something sharp, okay? But basically when we're dealing with the withdrawal reflex, this is when we, we encounter a painful stimulus and you pull your that whatever that body part that encounters that painful stimulus away from that stimulus there. Okay? So the receptor is what we call a nociceptor. Nociceptors, cool receptors, they monitor pain. Okay? They're, we'll talk about the different types of receptors in chapter 16. All right? So the nociceptor is going to transmit that pain stimuli information right, to the spinal cord. And it's going to activate some inner neurons. Well, guess what? Now we're dealing here, all right, we're dealing here with, all right, our um, a polysynaptic reflex, okay? So in this situation, all right, these inner neurons are going to excite the motor neurons that go to the flexor muscles, okay? Because when you flex the muscle, if I flex my bicep, I'm going to pull my hand away if I'm grabbing onto something hot. All right, if I'm stepping on something sharp, all right, all right, I'm going to pull my leg away using my hip flexor muscles and my knee flexor muscles, which are my hamstrings, right? Your hamstring muscles bend your knee, that's a flexor, okay? And so when that happens, we withdraw the limb from whatever that painful stimuli was. Well, all right, while that is occurring, all right, we have some other inner neurons that are going to, we heard this term before, reciprocally inhibit, all right, the motor neurons of the extensors. Because remember, we can't have both muscle groups contracting at the same time because then we won't have any type of action occurring. If I contract my extensors and my flexors at the same time, try it. Nothing's going to happen, okay, all right? If you try to contract your biceps and your triceps at the same time, your elbow's not going to bend, okay? So we are going to inhibit the extensors so we can invoke the withdrawal reflex quickly, okay, quickly. So I'm going to show you a picture here, and then I'll go over the last reflex with you, which is what we call the crossed extensor reflex, which this type of reflex usually coincides with the withdrawal reflex, right, especially if you're using your lower extremities, all right. So I'll come right back. All right, so let's don't pay attention, all right, to this side here. All right, don't pay attention to that. Okay. So here you are in the middle of the night, or in this case, this person steps on a rock. I step on a Lego. All right, that painful stimuli travels from the, the nociceptors, all right, up through that sensory neuron into the spinal cord. We've seen that. I think at this point we should all feel pretty comfortable about understanding the first half of a reflex, really. Stimuli, all right, and the sensory component to it, okay? So that sensory component then enters into the posterior portion of the spinal cord, all right? And in this case, what we're going to see, we're going to see, I better zoom in a little bit so you guys can see. All right, we're going to see how it stimulates the activation of an interneuron. That interneuron is then going to stimulate all right, the motor neuron to what? The flexors, all right? So that motor neuron is going to stimulate the flexors of your thigh, which are the hamstrings. And when they contract, look what happens. The, the knee bends. But while it's doing that, all right, it is going to then inhibit, all right, the quadriceps femoris muscle group, the, the flexors. Okay, so it's not on this drawing here, so I guess I can draw it myself. Here's another inner neuron here, all right, and here you have 
a motor neuron that goes to the extensors. And so it's going to inhibit the extensors. That reciprocal inhibition, so that the quadriceps femoris muscle group doesn't do anything. You feel, you feel me? Feel pretty good? Okay, all right. Some of you look bored, which is probably a good sign. Man. That means that you know what's going on. All right, so now let's talk about the last part, all right? The crossed extensor reflex, all right? So this will usually coincide, all right, with the withdrawal reflex. Okay, now we're going to actually see a reflex that involves the other side of the body, okay? So we're going to see some decusation, all right, of neurons here, okay? So, same type of situation that sensory, all right, that, that pain stimulus occurs on one side of the body, all right, that sensory neuron travels up into the spinal cord, all right, and in this case, all right, while it's affecting the, the motor neurons for the ipsilateral side of the body to withdraw, all right, it's going to then stimulate the inner neurons, all right, that are going to cross over to the other side of the body to excite the extensor motor neurons. And the reason why, if we stimulate the extensor motor neurons of the other thigh, your quadriceps muscles there, it is going to make sure that you don't bend your leg. Okay? So as the left leg is being withdrawn, the right leg's quadriceps are going to be stimulated so you don't bend your right knee, because if you bent your right knee, you'd crumble to the floor, okay? It's going to keep your right leg straight, and that's going to allow you to support your body weight, all right? So as you pull the limb away, I'm going to come right back to this, show you what I mean, all right? All right, so we already know, all right, the pain stimuli comes in, does its thing on the ipsilateral side of the body. All right, now what it's going to do is it's going to activate this inner neuron that's going to decusate and cross over, okay, and it's going to stimulate the motor neuron to the other leg's extensor group, all right, which is the quadriceps here on the other leg, and it keeps the knee from being bent. So as you withdraw this leg, all right, you can stay upright and not fall over. Because if this leg, if the knee bent, you would crumple down to the ground and you could hurt yourself. All right? So here's where we're actually going to deal with all right, a contralateral all right, reflex. The crossed extensor reflex crosses over. Still a spinal reflex because it, it's involving just the spinal cord. All right? But it is going to cross over. It's also an innate reflex. This is something that you're born with. All right? <clears throat> All right, questions? Almost done. One more thing I want to bring up. All right, why is it that when you go to a doctor, they hit you in the knee with a hammer? Okay, well, we want to test this reflex arc. That's what we want to do. It can tell us a lot as to what's going on. All right, so if we want to determine all right, if there's some issues going on, if it's, a, if it's a spinal reflex like any of these that we've been discussing, all right, we'll be able to determine certain components along the way, okay? So like the withdrawal reflex, we know which muscles are going to actually be a part of the withdrawal reflex so we can determine that and, and find out which muscles if we suspect some sort of issue going on, like multiple sclerosis, which is usually a, a central nervous system, but if you have like Guillain-Barre syndrome or damage to one of your peripheral nerves, all right? So we can test anything along that reflex arc, which includes muscles, specific nerves that supply those muscles, or the spinal cord segments that make up those nerves, which we'll talk about more in lab. So when we do reflex testing on people, all right, we're going to assess, all right, the actual reflex uh, result, okay? So if I tap you in the knee and your knee just kind of jumps a little bit, all right, then I'm going to grade that. So if it's a, a normal kind of twitch, 
then I would grade it and say, okay, everything's good. But say I tap it and I don't get anything. I tap it and I tap it and I do all these other things to try to invoke the reflex and nothing. Then you have what's known as a hypoactive reflex. All right? It's either there or if it's not, if it's if it's not it's either there or not there but if, it, sometimes it can be diminished so if it's diminished or absent then we will start to think okay you possibly damaged the spinal cord okay maybe some of those spinal cord segments the spinal nerves there were damaged somewhere like you have a nerve entrapment syndrome going on in your neck or in your low back somewhere okay if we're testing the limbs some sort of muscular disease, okay, guillain barre right, myasthenia gravis, right, which is a, a muscle, there's tons of them, uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, all right, there's several. Or there's something going on where the nerve actually, all right, is going to connect to the muscle itself, all right. So there's lots of different possibilities. Now, if I go to elicit that same reflex and your leg jumps crazy, and it keeps contracting, it keeps oscillating. And then eventually after like a minute, even in some cases I've seen it last for close to two minutes, and then the, nerve, and then the leg relaxes, all right? Then we would grade that as a hyperactive reflex, all right? Abnormally strong, okay? So now we're thinking upper motor neuron situation is going on. Something's going on up there in the brain or spinal cord, all right? And when you're sustaining that contraction where it kind of vibrates or shakes back and forth, we call that clonus. Okay? Clonus is when, all right, it just, it, you have these shaking rhythmic oscillations going on. All right? So basically, when you're talking about a hyperactive reflex, you're thinking what we call a UML, upper, upper motor neuron lesion. If you get a hypoactive reflex, then we're thinking mo lower motor neuron lesion, LML, okay? So with a hypoactive reflex, if you were to cut a nerve in somebody's arm or leg, they wouldn't be able to move their fingers, right, or toes, because we've severed that neuron, and we've severed the lower motor neuron. All right, questions about anything? No, not too bad. All right. All right, well, let's take a break then. And uh, we'll meet back and do some more labeling of uh, the spinal cord, and we'll talk more about the spinal cord. I get to talk to you about the anterior and posterior ramine, stuff like that.